are so, so very good to us. And we would ask, please fill us with your Holy Spirit tonight, that we would be your witnesses, and then bring us those divine appointments. There's so many people that, uh, well, they just need you. You love them, you died for them, and you've left us here to talk with them. So, uh, Father, we would be usable, we would be pleasing people in your sight. So bless the word as it goes out tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you hear me? Good. We are in Joshua chapter 10. If you came without a Bible and you need one, raise your hand. We'll put one in your hand. You can follow along. <coughs> no takers. That's, that's a good thing and a good thing. Um, this chapter, chapter 10, is one, uh, one of the more interesting chapters in the scripture that probably holds uh, the most significant uh, miracle uh, other than uh, the resurrection of Christ. Um, it's, it's something that if you've read the chapter, if you've read ahead, you, you know what I'm, I'm getting to. And and uh, it, it's just an just a awesome example for us because there's, there's lessons for us in this and how God sets this up and how Joshua cries out to the Lord and he does something specific for him, uh, a miracle that is just uh, baffles the mind of, of anybody who doesn't believe. Um, and actually, after we get it, and maybe after tonight, if you want to go and you can, and you can Google it, and, and there's just so many reasons uh, for why this particular thing happened, and, 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 and which none of them make any sense whatsoever. But, so you've got to have a lot of faith to believe those. Maybe they should, they're, they're, they're obviously believing in the wrong thing. So. But uh, as we journeyed with uh, Joshua and the nation of Israel, and they crossed into the promised land, they've had some... Uh, great battles that uh, the Lord did and that they won, and they had some battles that the Lord didn't do, and uh, they went out on their own without praying, and uh, it was a failure. But God, we saw how God redeemed them and used the same uh, thing that they did wrong as a blessing, and we're going to see that uh, the, other, the next thing that they did wrong, because the first thing uh, they did is, if you remember, they went and attacked AI because they, oh, they're so small, you know. Hey, we only need a few thousand people. Well, they never talked to the Lord, and, and uh, it didn't work out too well for them. They lost. And then, uh, so after the victory at, uh, uh, at AI, um, they were tricked. And why were they tricked? Anybody know? Anybody remember? Because they never asked the Lord. They never prayed. And that's how we kind of get in trouble too sometimes, isn't it? Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to pick up in chapter 10. And it says here, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho, and its king. So he had, uh, and now the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. So last week, that's what we saw. Gibeon had said, they made up this big story, they made up this big lie, they got moldy bread, they got dirty clothes, ripped clothes, and they came down and said, oh, you know, we've heard what your God did in Egypt, and we heard what uh, uh, your God did uh, um, to the Amorites, and here we are. You know, we want to be friends with you guys. And Israel had to be going, yeah, let's be friends. You know, you come from a far country. It was okay to make allegiance with um, countries that were far away, but it wasn't right for them. God told them not to make allegiance with people in the land. And they were, they were actually what? The next people, that, the next city, the next nation that they were going to get, was going to get destroyed, that Israel was going to hunt down. And they tricked them, and they did not seek the Lord so uh, Gibeon uh, 
uh, ended up making a, a, a pact with them. And, and, and Joshua swore to them that they would protect them. So now you have this Adonai Zedek, who has a, it's a very interesting name. And it says here that he's what? The king of Jerusalem. Did you catch that? Okay, so Adonai means what? Lord, right? Zedek means of righteousness, right? Sounds like Melchizedek. Mel means what? Prince. Zedek means, or Zedek means of righteousness. So Melchizedek was prince of righteousness. This guy here, the king of Jerusalem, he's the lord of righteousness. Hmm, interesting fellow, huh? And he's what? Of Jerusalem. He's the king, and he's a phony. And he's an imposter, and he's an antichrist, because there's only one of Lord of righteousness, isn't there? And that's Jesus Christ. Oh, and by the way, the Lord of righteousness would not want to destroy Israel, would he? <coughs> so this guy is a total imposter. He's a fake. He's a phony. He has the name. Yeah, maybe, obviously. Adonai Zenith, king of Jerusalem, heard how what? Joshua. Now, that's not true either, is it? Joshua didn't do anything. It was the Lord. Isn't that what Gibeon said? It was the Lord, your God, that destroyed Egypt and the Amorites. And so here you have this phony, but you have this this guy who's in this basically the center of the world you know you look at the scripture everything revolves basically when it comes to a place around jerusalem doesn't it i mean it's all about jesus christ but the place is israel it's jerusalem and where the christ jesus is going to set up his kingdom to come so here you have this guy in the, in the center of the world who's a liar, who's a deceiver. And uh, he says that Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it, and Jericho as well. So now they're going after Gibeon. It says in verse 2 that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. They had a pretty good stronghold in Gibeon, but now they're neutral, in a sense. Uh, they won't become that way, but they're neutral. So they feared greatly because of, of that, because they were hoping that they would be on their side to fight Joshua. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, uh, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron. Now, I can understand somebody naming their kid Adonai Zedek, not really, but to name your kid Hoham. I mean, what the heck are they thinking? Hey, Hoham, what you doing? Yeah. Anyway, uh, so here you have this other guy, Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japia, king of Latius, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come back up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. So this is kind of like the backbone of the land as, as Israel is going right up the middle, and then they're going to turn south and then go up north. Uh, they never totally... Uh, get all the land. Uh, they get pretty close, um, but they don't really get uh, all the land, and they won't until Jesus comes back. Now, it's kind of interesting, these names that, that are here, this, this Hoham, king of Hebron, uh, his name means crush or destroy. Uh, Hebron... Um, it gives you the, uh, a, he has a name of like a spell or an illusion or a, a, um, yeah, like a spell. So they're going to cast a spell on you. Uh, Pyram, king of Jarmuth. Pyram means uh, to run wild. 
Uh, Jarmuth is some, somebody that's haughty or self-exalted. You getting the picture? Are we getting the picture here? Yeah. Uh, then we have Japia, king of Latius. Uh, Japia means uh, show off, somebody that's self-exalted, uh, just like the Jarmuth guy or the city, um, but like a show off. Lakish means um, someone that's lifted up. Uh, you ever tried to talk to somebody who is who was a one upper? So they always had to, you know, you told a story and you and you uh, you know made four hole in ones on the golf course and they tell you they made five. You know, oh, I knitted two sweaters in, in one day. Well, they knitted three. You know, they don't even know what a knitting needle is, but it, it's somebody that you, you can't really talk to. You, you, you can't explain anything to them. They're, they're, they're stuck in their ways, and everything is about themselves. When you say to them, you're to uh, love your enemies and pray for your enemies, they look at you like, what? Do what? I thought we were supposed to shoot them. Um, Debir, uh, it means to declare, which is interesting. And Eglon is um, somebody who would be all over the place. They're just constant movement, can't settle down, can't stop. They're just, just totally all over the place. Do we get a picture here of, of the crushing spell of somebody who's wild and self-exalted, let alone they're following who? They're following the Lord of righteousness. Do you get this picture of why, why God is going to destroy these nations? Do you get the picture? And, it, and it's a good lesson for us because we can be this, we can be any of these ways as a Christian as well. We can stumble and fall. We can be self-exalted. We could think that, uh, you know, we are... Uh, God needs us, and without us, you know, God, I'm sorry, but you can't do much. And we can get that way. So, <clears throat> verse 4 says, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children. So he's getting these guys together. This Antichrist is going to go in and now fight Joshua. Uh, just like, uh, uh, you know, in Revelation, how the Antichrist gets together with a group of nation and nations and what? Goes to fight the second Joshua, Jesus Christ, right? <clears throat> um, Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Latius, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up they and all their armies encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Now, it's kind of interesting because um, they're making all these plots and they're making all these plans. Now they're going to go right there at Gibeon and, and what they don't know is that Israel's going to go and fight with them. That the God Almighty, the creator's, creator of the heavens and the earth is going to be fighting against them. And, and, and all these... Interesting because all these nations, all these heathen nations get together to fight against God. Well, you just planned a great plan, right? You know, right there in the middle of the plains, you guys all gathered together so it make it easier for God to wipe you out. That's some real good plan in there. Let's go after this. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us. And help us, for all the king and the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. So Joshua gets the men to get together, and look at that word, ascended. So they ascended, they went up. And with him and the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I had delivered Deliver them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Now, it's kind of interesting um, because God is gathering these, these people together that want to fight against him. God tells Joshua, look, I got this. I got this. 
It's okay. Do not fear, he says in verse 8. I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Now, uh, this is prophetic um, past tense, which means uh, it means it's in the future, but it's already happened. In other words, God's already done it. You just got to go there and claim it. Kind of like going into the promised land. Kind of like this for us. God's already got you, your name in the Lamb's book of life. God already looks at you as being perfect. We're not. But he looks at it that way through his, because of the, what his son did and the blood that was shed for us, right? Even though we're a foul-up, even though we couldn't get two things right, we don't know our elbow from our fist, he still looks at you that way. You're already in heaven with him, in a sense. It's already a done deal. It's just time to walk through the door. And when we're finished doing our work here on earth, then we're going to be walking through the door. So this is what he's telling Joshua. It's already a done deal. I've already kicked their butt. It's no big deal. Just go. Just go. Now, this next part's just like God. <laughs> Joshua, therefore, came upon them suddenly, suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. Now, they're going to Gibeon to fight. It's a 12-hour journey. They went at night. It's 25 miles. Why does it take 12 hours? Because it's up elevated 4,000 feet. They were walking uphill for 25 miles at night. Now keep that in mind because as soon as they get to the ridge at the top of the mountain... You know who's there? The enemy. So then they got to start fighting. Now, we just walked 12 hours, 4,000 feet up, 25 miles uphill. And now we're expected to fight. Uh, God, you sure you got that right? But what an awesome thing. See, God gave them their part. Now it's time for them to fulfill their responsibility. Sound familiar? God gave us a part, didn't he? And it's time for us to fulfill our responsibility, isn't it? It's time for us. Walking uphill, doesn't it feel like it, it, that's what it's like being a Christian? Doesn't it feel like we're always walking uphill? You know, it, it, no matter what we do, it's, we're always trying to get to the top. We're always trying to walk up that hill. And on the other side of that hill is the battle, isn't it? But see, we have a responsibility. It's, it's really a blessing. It's, nothing, uh, it's not something that we would look at uh, in a negative sense, but it's in a positive sense. Because we know that we go up and down, don't we? Up and down, we're on top. Yeah, everything's great. Next thing you know, right to the bottom. And it's, but, but see, that thing is, is, and you all will admit it if you think about it, if you don't admit, admit it because you know it so well because you've done it so many times, but those things when we're on the bottom, when we're in the valley, that's where God can teach us, and that's where God can mold us, and that's where God fights for us. And we're going to see a battle that God is going to stop the earth, the sun won't go down. And these guys, it, the nation of Israel, they'll not wa only walk up there, but they're going to see this awesome, spectacular display by God that they'll remember all their life. And then as they chase these guys, they realize that, hey, there's not enough time in the day to wipe these guys out. And, and Joshua's going to cry out, and say, Lord, stop the sun. And he does. And it's kind of like a picture in our life. As we go through the battles and we go through the, the struggles and 
We need to step up and say, Lord, you know, I can't do this. Stop the sun. Stop this noise in my head. Stop all the deception that I go through. Stop this so I can live for you, that I can do what's right and not have to fight this fight. Let's fight this fight now and get it over with. Stop the sun. Make the sun stand still. So here they are on this trek up this, up this mountain, up 4,000 feet, 12-hour, 25-mile journey. And it says, So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azkot and Macada. Now, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> Beth Horon means the house of wrath. Okay. Now get this picture. Azekah um, means fenced in. And Makada means hoarded. So God, okay, is hoarding them into this fenced in area called the house of wrath. And Israel's going to destroy them. See, you know, I used to wonder all the time. Why does God give us these weird names? Until I started looking them up and realized what it gives you a picture of what's going on. Can we see it? Can we see this picture of these, uh, the, these nations, these, these nations that were coming against God, coming against Joshua, how he hoarded them in, and then how he fenced them in in this place called the House of Wrath? Interesting, isn't it? just like our God. Uh, verse 11, And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azka, where they were fenced in. And they died. There were no more who died from the hail... There, there were more who died from the hailstones then the children of Israel killed with the sword. So here they are. They're up on the top of this mountain. They come over the top. They, 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 they were up all day. Then Joshua decides, let's go at night. So they get there at night. When the time comes, they charge over the mountain to take these guys out. Now, this here was an 800-foot drop. So now you, you're tired. You haven't slept in 24 hours. Uh, you just climbed 4,000 feet. Now you're fighting. Now all of a sudden, you've got to go down 800 feet to this other city, and now uh, if you go if now if you go to Israel, you could see all of this, and they kind of had like uh, I don't know I guess the best word I could use was like platforms like okay so you climb up the stairs so many steps and I think it's code and then you have this platform so you can walk sideways and then you go up the city. you know how that is when you go somewhere and there's a, a lot of steps there's there's a platform to give you rest I guess so these this place actually has, if you go and look, you'll see there's a, a natural uh, platform, uh, you know, a plateau that kind of flattens out and then you keep going down. But they come over the hill and they kill these guys. Now they're heading down. And what happens? The Lord goes before them and drops these hailstones on top of them, of the people. And more hailstone, hail, the hailstones killed more uh, people than the children of Israel did. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> kind of interesting that, uh, uh, you know, something for you, if, if, if you look up this word hailstones, and it's not hail like we think, but it's rocks. So God dropped rocks. Now, what's the penalty for blasphemy? Stoning. Yeah, death by stoning, right? God was stoning these kings. Uh, verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. Now it's kind of interesting. They just fought this battle. Now they're coming down. It's daytime. 
The daytime is starting, so they must have been fighting for a while. And they, they got these guys on the run. They can destroy them. And what do they ask the Lord to do? To stop the sun. This is what, this is what Joshua does. He asks them, stop the moon, stop the sun. So that we can continue, so that we could finish this fight. And this is what we as Christians need to do. We need to finish the fight. Now, our fight is not with each other. Our fight is not with the world. It's not with the government. Uh, it's not with Donald Trump. It's not with Joe Biden. It's not with China. It's against the powers and principalities of the air. That's who our fight is with. And <coughs> that's the fight we need to fight, isn't it? We need to take our eyes off of the flesh and put our eyes on the spirit. And this is, this is what this whole chapter is about. Keep our eyes and our focus on him. This little stuff doesn't matter. This bickering, this arguing, this striving with the government because, you know, they're going to raise the price of gas to $100 million. I don't know, but it's kind of interesting that it's four bucks, but, uh, which is really kind of sad. But it, it, you look at the things that go around in the world and the killings and the murders in these cities that are not being reported. You look at the, the turmoil in this nation and you know that the time is near. But we have to continue to fight. We have to continue to battle. And we do that with prayer. And here Joshua says, <laughs> he sp speaks to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And in the sight of Israel. Wouldn't that be something awesome? Let alone all these stones coming down from heaven plopping on these people let alone having them. And, and I can guarantee you, because this is just like the Lord. You know, they spent 40 years in the desert. Did their shoes wear out? No. Did their clothes wear out? No. Did they go without a meal? No. They were all perfectly healthy when they came out of it. I can imagine these guys, you know, were running up this mountain, even Joshua, as old as he was, probably running up this mountain like he was a kid because it was Lord's led. It was the Lord that led it. You know, you take an old man like Peter. I mean, he wasn't that old, but we look at him as being one of the older guys of the apostles. And, and they were out fishing after Jesus was resurrected. And, and they, uh, they didn't catch any fish. And he, he called and he said, hey, did you guys catch any fish? I'm paraphrasing all of this. So, uh, hey, did you catch any fish? And, and, he, and uh, they said, no, we didn't catch any. He said, well, throw it over on the other side of the boat. So they threw it over and they got all this fish to where the boat almost tipped over. So then uh, they recognize that it was uh, Jesus. So Peter jumps in the water and he goes running over there, you know, and the other guys are pulling in all this fish and they bring the boat up and, and, uh, and uh, uh, God said to Peter to bring in the fish. And, and it says in the scripture that he picked it up and he moved it. Okay, so they couldn't move it almost to where it tipped over the boat. But Peter manhandles this and pulls it ashore. Guarantee we get to heaven. Well, I don't guarantee it, but we get to heaven, and Samson's probably going to be some little short guy, you know, three foot eight, and weighs about 64 pounds, with long hair. With long hair. Because you know, with God, you can do anything, right? So here, Joshua cries out in the sight of Israel, and he says, Son, Stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ashkelon. So the sun stood still. Wow. Now, I don't know about you, but I've read that several times and I get goosebumps each time. Joshua, much better man than I am, or ever will be, but you have the creator of all things. Listen to a man. Son, stand still. And it did. And it did. And it's encouragement for me, and it should be encouragement for you, that I can ask the Lord, that you could ask the Lord, Lord, help me. 
Lord, have the sun stand still so that I can fight this battle. That we together can fight this battle. And he would hear us. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. How long was that? No idea. Now, it's kind of interesting because, like I said, if you, if you Google this stuff, you, you'll get all kinds of people telling you all kinds of things. Well, come out to the bottom line is, okay, so if this didn't happen, all right, how come there was no people in the nation of Israel got hit with them rocks? God's a bad aim? You know, he's a very good aim. What do you mean that didn't happen? Okay, well, in Egyptian history, Babylonian history, and Greek history, uh, and the Chinese emperor all wrote of a long day. Hmm. All right. Well, yeah. So the Incas on the other side of the world wrote of what? A long night. Hmm. Nah. It's more plausible that it was an earthquake. It was a natural phenomenon. And that's what you're going to get a read if you read, look up like Joshua's long day or something like that. They're stupid. I mean, you would believe that. Don't they? Not that God has to prove anything, but historically it's backed up. Oh, there was no such thing as Jesus. Oh, well, historically, it's backed up. Oh, well, there was no man resurrected. Ah, well, historically, it was backed up. You know, they have greater faith than we do because to believe in something like that, it's got to take some really great faith, right? So here they are. God tells them, you know, hey, no problem. I got this. They're already dead. I'll stop the sun, Joshua, my son. I'll stop the sun and the moon for you. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? Now, there is actually, you could go online and order this book, not the one that actually has this on there, but there is uh, a a very historical book um, called Jasher. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Now, do we have this picture of these guys being up all day, being ready to go to battle? And Joshua says, okay, it's nighttime. Let's run up this mountain. Going up 4,000 feet, 25 miles. Oh, and we got to be there by daybreak. Oh, and we got to get in a fight. And then we got to turn around and we got to chase them down the hill and fight with them. Oh, and then God's going to take all these stones and he's going to stone them. Oh, and then we're going to keep running and the day's going to keep going on because we're going to keep chasing these guys. Uh, Joshua, are you nuts? You're crazy, right? It's kind of like, let's go walk around this building for a week and do nothing. <clears throat> And there had been no day like that before it or after that that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned, and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. I don't know how long they were up. Sounds like, what, two full days or something, maybe even longer than that. Uh, How long the, the moon and the sun stood still, I have... No idea. How did God do it? I have no idea, but he does, and he can do it. He created it. He could slow down, his, maybe tip it further on its axis. You know, obviously, he probably didn't just stop all at once, although he might have, but I would have thought we would have all flown off. That's what I've heard. I don't know. That's never happened, so really, it doesn't really matter what they say. But God could have done whatever he wanted. He could have just slowed it down to, the, to, to so slow so slow that it seemed like it stopped. I don't know. But you know what? I far believe that than than an earthquake. And my heart 
is just so overwhelmed when I think that Joshua would ask the Lord that and he would do that, just like that. And it, which is really kind of awesome because when you think about it, you'd have to have a really great relationship, wouldn't you? You know, I, I always think of Paul and, uh, you know, when he had that thorn in the flesh and he was kind of complaining to God, although he wasn't, but he kind of was. And he was saying, uh, you know, Lord, I prayed to you three times. I still have this. What's going on? And I think of that and I think, wow, you know, I've played, prayed for months and years and stuff. And not that the Lord's not working, but to have that re type of relationship that you would say, Lord, you know, I, I've asked you three times, hey, get rid of this thorn in my flesh. And sometimes the Lord does answer, and I don't hear, and that's probably the problem, and I just keep right on going on. And asking again and again and again, I'm like that woman that kept coming to the king and asking her every time. Finally, he just gave in. He said, okay, forget it. I'll give it to you because I don't want to have to deal with you anymore. But <clears throat> What an awesome relationship Joshua must have had. And... In a way, it should make us envious, but in a good way, that we would want to be like that, that we would want to have that relationship. Obviously, the only one we want to be like is Jesus. To have a relationship like that, that's really awesome. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have to ask Joshua, okay, did it really stop or was it moving really, really slow? It just, you know, no, I'm not really going to ask that because we'll know all things when we get to heaven, won't we? And there had been no day like that before or after that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. But these five kings had fled and hidden themselves in a cave uh, at uh, Mekedah, which is the herded place. Um, <clears throat> so he's herding them together again for the nation of Israel. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings have been found hidden in the cave of Machedah. So Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. And do not stay there yourselves, but pursue your enemies and attack their rear guard. Do not allow them to enter their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hands. So they didn't want to stop. They just put rocks in front of the cave that they were in, and they kept right on going and fighting right on going. God called them to do a job. Their responsibility was to fight these nations. And they did it. And they kept doing it. You know, it's kind of interesting because all the bad things we think of the nation of Israel, what they did, you know, they complained all the time. What are you giving us this manna? What is it? Come on. What do, you know, we, we had it better. You're trying to kill us here in the desert. We had it better in in, in Egypt, you know, all the garlic and the leeks and the cucumbers that we had. Oh, and the meat, the meat that we... What are you talking about? You guys were slaves. You get nothing. But you look at them here and you see this and they see that, hey, let's go walk 12 hours, 25 miles, up 4,000 feet, and then fight. Oh, and then God will extend the, the day to another day. And you're going to keep fighting. And you're going to chase these guys. Oh, and you got their kings, but pfft, nope. Keep right on going. I think they fulfilled their responsibility. Well, at least for a period of time, right? <clears throat> Verse 20, then it happened while Joshua and the children of Israel made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they had finished that, that those who had escaped entered 40 fortified cities. Um, and, the, and all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Machedah in peace. No one moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me. So this Antichrist gets these nations together to attack Joshua, 
to destroy, to attack Gibeon and, and in turn attacking Joshua. Attacking Israel. Fighting against them. Gathered them together. Now it's kind of interesting, does it, does it sound familiar to you? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Yeah, chapter 6. Might be 16, but <clears throat> let's try 6 first. Hey, Bart, which is it? 6 or 6? No, I'm just kidding. The men went through the... Yeah, it's chapter 6, verse 15. And it says this, And the kings of the earth, the great men the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. God's herding them together. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Interesting picture, isn't it? Here, all the way back in Joshua... In the end, what verse was that? 15. Chapter 6, verse 15. Back to uh, Joshua. Okay, and, so, and they did so and brought out those five kings to him from the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of righteousness, Right? the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. So it was when they brought out those kings to Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, Come, here, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks. Then Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Partnership with God is what Israel had. Are we in partnership with him? Are we fighting the fight with him? Are we going out on our own like they did with Ai? And if you do, you know what? Just repent, turn around. God will redeem it. God will redeem it. So it's interesting because here they failed with, uh, by not praying. They protected uh, Hebron. But, or, I'm sorry, they, they protected Gibeon. So in that protection, after their failure, what did God do? He used it. He used it to bring all the herd and fence in all these nations to the house of wrath where he could stone them, where the nation of Israel could have victory. Now, it's interesting because you might be thinking, you know, wow, that's kind of bad. But God waited. God give them, gave them grace for years upon years upon years to turn away from their sin, and they wouldn't do it. And what is going to happen in the end? All those people out there in the world who do not know him will not recognize him. God will give them what they want. They don't want to have nothing to do with God, do they? They don't want to have no part in anything that he is about. They don't want to know him. And God's going to let them live through eternity without him, which is going to be a sad day. Because that's hell. Damnation. He'll re they'll really get to see how much God had his hand on the world, holding back evil till the right time. So I understand, as some of us look at this, might think, oh man, that's pretty mean. No. What you miss is the grace that he's given them, the mercy the calling out to them, they wouldn't hear of it. 
You remember uh, when we were in, uh, I believe it was Deuteronomy, and we saw how some of those nations, the reason that they had that land, even though they were a heathen nation, God helped them to get that land, and then they turned away from him. And then Israel destroyed them. Years and years and years and years later, Don't be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus the Lord will do to your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward, Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the tree until evening. So it was at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees, cast them into the cave where they had been hidden, and laid large stones against the cave's mouth, which remain till this very day. He gave them that they wanted. They wanted to hide in those caves. He gave it to them. He let them have it. Interesting. Do we want God to stop time so we can deal with our sin? We should. How awesome that would be. You know, God had Joshua Joshua was the man that stood in the gap. Are we willing to be are we willing to be those people? To stand in the gap and pray for somebody? Maybe we don't know their situation, maybe we don't agree with their situation. Maybe we think they're you know, empty-headed. Don't call anybody empty-headed, but remember maybe we think they're empty-headed. Are we willing to stand in a gap? Are we willing to stand up like, like Joshua and pray and ask the Lord help? What do we do? And I know we do that, but is that our life? Is that the first thing that comes to our mind? Is that what we're supposed to do? Is that what we're doing? Is that part of our responsibility? Are we taking on that responsibility? Well, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22. So it's right after Jeremiah. Actually, it's not. It's actually after Lamentations. But <clears throat> Jeremiah, I figured you'd be easier to find if you didn't know where it was. Ezekiel 22. Okay, maybe I can't find it. Cha uh, verse 30, I'm sorry. Chapter 22, verse 30, it says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Do we want to make a stand? Do we want God to stop the sun? Are we going to him in prayer for the battles that we face? Or are we just kind of just existing, waiting for him to come back so we could go home? Which is it? Well, I want to encourage you, get out there and get stuff done because the faster we get it done, the faster we get to go home, right? You know, we could look at this, the stuff that's going on in the world and how uh, things are right now and, and how people are afraid. This is a great opportunity to be a witness, to stand up. But it starts with you and your heart. See, the problem, the problem was... The heart of these nations, wasn't it? Their hearts were turned away from God. We don't want to be like that. We want our hearts to be pure. We want our hearts to be turned towards him. We, wanted to listen. we want to listen to him and follow him. And yes, it's difficult. I'm not that naive. And, and really, uh, you know, I, I had the same struggles that every one of us do, maybe on a different, maybe a different thing, 
You know, I, uh, you know, never really took alcohol, so I can't relate to somebody who has that and how it controls them and how it puts things in their head. But I can relate to, uh, you know, my sins and the things that I struggle with, how, how those things are put into my head and how I struggle with that. So we have the same struggles, but not on the same things. But see, can we go to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I want to fight this, but I can't do it without you, and I won't do it without you. But if you fight this battle for me, even if it takes three long days and the sun stands still for three days, Or maybe you need to stand in the gap and you hear all these things and you hear about these people in, in the church, in the fellowship that are struggling. Are you standing in the gap for them? Are you praying for them? Are we praying for our land? Are we praying for our nation? You know, we, we pretty much know the end result for this country, don't we? There's no recognition of it in the scripture. Whether for the Lord or not. So obviously we're maybe not in the picture or maybe a second world country. Yeah, I'd like to go home. But, you know, I also love my country, what it stood for in the beginning and what you, what you read about. And, and, and yeah, I'm beginning to love my enemies as the Lord changes our hearts. But will we stand in the gap? Remember in Ezekiel, I can't find no man to stand in the gap so I could heal their land. How terrible. I don't want to get to heaven and say, Don, you did. <laughs> you got up here by the skin of your teeth. But you know, I put all these things on your heart and you didn't want to stand with me and fight. You just kind of went through the motions. Ah, oh, you know, it's okay. The Lord will forgive me. I'm still getting to heaven. Do we really want to tell the Lord that? Hopefully we never have to. We need to be praying for our country, praying for the world that's lost out there. This could turn into a huge, this could be the last revival before the Lord comes back. And he's using this just like he herded these nations into the fenced area to the house of, the, of wrath. Just like he uses all our failures. Because you know, being that I don't struggle with uh, alcohol I can't, it's hard for me to talk to somebody that has that. I, I don't understand. Just stop. Sure, it's that easy. Well, what's your sin? Well, you know, just stop. Oh, boy, got me there. Now I feel like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Hypocrite. But someone who's went through that, God is redeeming it. Gives you an open door. Or whatever it might be. You know, I always, when I go through things, I always think, okay, how's God going to use this? But, but that's after I whine and complain. Don't get me wrong, you know. And I ask three times, hey, Lord, you know, quit this. This isn't up for me. It's actually more like 3,000 times, but... <clears throat> What are we going to do about it? We heard it. He told us. Are we willing to walk 4,000 uh, 4, feet? 25 miles? 12-hour march? Oh, and then we get to the other side and we have to fight. We have to fight on the way down. But the Lord was there. And isn't that like our walk sometimes? We go up, and we get to the peak, and it's great. I imagine when they got up there, they're like, yeah, and then all oh, no. We got to fight these guys? Hey, we haven't slept in a day. What are you doing? Great plan, Josh. Nice job. Appreciate it. Can we get a...
quick nap over here, you know. But no, God said keep moving, keep pressing forward. If you're tired, here, let me take care of this for you. Let me drop a few rocks. And then they keep battling. Do we see that here for us? Do we see this lesson? Do we see that you and God are a majority? You know, he could have just taken Joshua up there and done the same thing, couldn't he have? Oh, he didn't even use Joshua. Do you really think he needed the trumpets for Jericho? Come on. No, he didn't. So what do you get out of this? Are we encouraged to fight? Fight to the end? Now remember, it's not a fight amongst ourselves. If it's flesh, it's, that's not the fight. The fight is spiritual. Stand in the gap. Get on your knees every morning. And, he, and sit there until the Lord brings you who he wants you to pray for. And pray for him. Stand in the gap. Pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. You know, uh, the Lord can take whatever it is our president has away from him anytime he wants. It makes him so forgetful and slur his words and forgot how to tie his shoes and whatever else it is that they, I don't know whether it's true or not, so I should, probably shouldn't say it, but if you listen to him, he, he's, yeah. But he needs prayer. He needs to get saved. That's what he needs. And isn't that what all of us needs? You know, I have a friend. He's a great guy. He's got problems. How do I solve these problems? I can't. What are you asking me for? You need Jesus. That's what you need. I've told this story before. I worked in a, in a, a, a Jewish community in Ohio, and uh, I met this one guy, and he was the kosher rabbi, and he basically ran the place, and uh, I had a lot of good friendships in there. I, li I really liked a lot of them, most of them, uh, you know, that I knew I liked. There was a few that were kind of rough around the edges, but, uh, and there was a few that I loved to argue with because we would argue about Scripture, which was kind of interesting because they would take chunks of Scripture out and say, you can't use these. And it's like, okay, well, whatever, I'll get you on the other ones. But... Uh, and he was a great guy, and I, I, I went to his wedding, and I worked at his house, which is very unusual to do. And he, a lot of times, asked me, what do I do in this situation? What do I? So one day, we're sitting in his car, and he's, he's, tell, he's going through some struggles in his marriage. And he, he's telling me what's going on, and I'm just sitting there listening, thinking to myself, what do I tell him, Lord? Because, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell him. This is way beyond my pay grade. I'm just, you know, a plumber working on a building, you know. And he just, uh, he just keeps going on. And this is a relationship that I had for two or three years with him. And uh, we never had any problems. He knew I was a Christian. And he, but he said to me, what do I do? What do I do? And you know what the answer was that I gave him, that the Lord told me? I told him, huh, you need Jesus. That's the problem. He never talked to me again. He said, get out of my car, because we were sitting in his car. I'm like, oh, boy, get out of my car. And I never talked to me again. Sad. But when the Lord puts him on my heart, I pray for him. Because you know what? We all need Jesus, don't we? We all need Jesus. And you know, us in here, our mothers or fathers or grandfathers or a neighbor or somebody, aunt, uncle, somebody in a store, Looked at the look on your face when you were struggling before you were saved and said, Lord, I want to pray for that person. I don't know their name, but they need you. And thankfully, thankfully, we have Jesus. Amen? So what are you going to do? The fight's right in front of you. It's your responsibility. Stand in the gap. Step up to the plate. Whatever you want to use, what words you want to use to encourage yourself. And let's encourage one another. Is our relationship with him better today than it was yesterday? 
Now think about that. And it was maybe last week when you were on the mountaintop. Is our relationship better today? And if the answer is no, a really good pastor used to say, if your relation, his name was Chuck Smith, if your relationship isn't better today than it was yesterday, you're backsliding. Do you know more, Jesus more today? Well, I hope so. You saw a picture of a picture that he's trying to show you in your life. Do we understand? So after the service, we'll have some men up here to pray and their wives if they're here. Come on up. You got something to pray about, don't you? Stand in the gap for your country. Well, Father, we just so thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples that you give us. We thank you that your word tells us that these things that we read are examples for us. Father, we just, we are just a needy people and we need you. And we need you to motivate us to get us going. We need you to help us stand in the gap. We need you to help us do everything because we can do nothing without, apart from you. And we know that, Lord. And if we don't, Lord, I, I hope that you show us that, Lord. I really do, because we need to understand that. But, Father, we love you. We look forward to the day when we can uh, wrap our arms around you and hold you, and you hold us. We look forward to the day when we don't have to give in to the, uh, the flesh, these flesh tents that we live in. Father, we look forward to the day when we can put our head on your shoulder and tell you how much we love you and how we look back and see all these things that you've done for us in our lives, how you've protected us and guided us, how you've so blessed us. And Father, I ask for each and every one here today that you just bless them. Bless them beyond their understanding. Bless them in a way that, uh, that they have never thought of before because we always think of things, Lord, you know that. Uh, of, of how you, you could bless us, you know, bless me with that Lamborghini or whatever. But Lord, show us, Lord, how much you love us. Bless, bless us in that way. And you say you will in your scripture. But Lord, most of all, we want to stand with you. We want to walk with you. We want to go over that mountaintop with you, heading down the hill of, of your enemies, praying for them all the way. Father, we love you, we thank you, we thank you for the lessons that we've learned today, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, and all his children said,